everybody. Welcome to the morning show. We're coming to you today on WJOPLP Newburyport at FM 96.3 on Channel 9 and on Newburyport Community Media's YouTube station at ncmhub.org. I'm your host, Mary Jacobson, and I'm happy to report that today we're going to be talking about a topic that is really important and has been recently getting the attention that it deserves. That's intergenerational family, intergenerational trauma. And we have the perfect person with us today to talk about this. She's in no small part responsible for the attention that it is finally receiving. Dr. Sandra Matar is a licensed psychologist with more than 25 years of clinical and teaching experience. She's currently an assistant professor and clinical psychologist at Boston University School of Medicine in Psychiatry. At Boston Medical Center, she's training director of the Immigrant and Refugee Health Center, and she's a psychologist at the Boston Center for Refugee Health and Human Rights. Dr. Matar's research interests are at the intersection of psychological trauma and culture, immigrants and refugee mental health, mental health disparities, and mindfulness and spirituality. And as if to prove, if we needed any further proof, that she's truly a Renaissance woman, Dr. Matar also holds a yoga teacher certification and has done several years of training in Buddhist philosophies. Dr. Matar, welcome, and thank you so much for taking time to visit The Morning Show. Thank you so much for having me here. Oh, I really appreciate it. You know, let's start with some basics. First, the word trauma, I think, has become so commonly used that I often fear that its overuse may have obscured its more specific psychological, neurological, and physiological meanings and origins. So let's start, if you could please define trauma and give some examples and specifically explain how do our brains and bodies respond to traumatic events? Yeah, you're right in, in saying that the word trauma is misused. Uh, the fact that we go through a traumatic event doesn't mean that we will all develop PTSD because people have resilient mechanisms to overcome the trauma. And only between six and 8% of the population will develop PTSD mm -hmm. uh, when they experience a traumatic event. Mm -hmm. So what is trauma? Trauma usually happens, or PTSD, I would say, happens when the body and mind's capacity to deal with life is overtaken, the body and mind are overwhelmed, and they are not able to basically go to baseline of functioning. Mm -hmm. And so we start using mechanisms or behaviors that are based on fear and yeah. based on the traumatic event rather than the actual present moment. So we live in the past, basically, yeah. which is what you see in many many people that have been through severe trauma. Uh, you see it in veterans, you see, you see it in women that have been uh, abused, you see it in, in people uh, that are uh, descendants of slaves, you see that that is currently uh, impacting them. Yes. Yeah. So I wanna make sure that I understand you in effect what happens when we experience a traumatic effect. And not all of us will have the same response, but right. for some of us, it overwhelms our body's ability to respond. Um, and what happens then is that um, we wind up sort of, it almost sounds as though we're trapped temporarily between two worlds. That's the, exactly right. The present that our body is currently inhabiting, but in our minds and the way that we've processed it, we're in large part also still living in the past. Have I understood you? That's absolutely right. In fact, they don't use cues of the present moment to mm -hmm. assess, cognitively assess and emotionally assess what's happening. They use cues only uh, based on remembering the past mm -hmm. and they are activated or triggered by the past. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to bring them to the present moment when you do treatment with them mm -hmm. and breathing, for example, teaching them how to breathe. It's a great mechanism to help them embody themselves mm -hmm. because people People that go through trauma and they experience PTSD, they are not present in their bodies. Mm -hmm. Basically, they're living here. That's what mm -hmm. I like to say. Uh, yeah. And so their body is disconnected. And the idea is to bring them back, is to help them, okay, let's engage their parasympathetic system so that the body can come down to baseline. Well, and, and this helps explain the interest in mindfulness <laughs> that comes yeah. through in your bio, because, yeah. you know, trauma or no trauma, I think so many of us have a hard time being 
in our bodies, <laughs> being right. mentally in the same place that our bodies are physically inhabiting. So that's interesting that a preliminary intervention then in your work is simply to use breath yeah. and attentiveness to breath um, as a way to encourage people to develop the skill of being fully present in the present moment where their bodies actually are inhabiting. Yes, so. and they, they uh, usually share that they experience such a relief it's oh. they tell me, oh, it's like a load has been uh, taken off my shoulders. Oh. I, uh, I have not felt this in a long time. Uh, so that's one of the techniques. Uh, sleep is also very important. People that have PTSD don't usually like to go to sleep. Why? Because they're going to have nightmares and they're going to relive the event, the traumatic event. So also I the the second line of of. Uh, sort of intervention is for me with my patients is to deal with their sleep. It is important that they sleep um, at least eight hours. And yeah. although, and you know, on average, people with significant PTSD, if they're able to sleep, they're able to sleep two to three hours per night. Oh, gosh. And, uh, yeah. And so that has uh, tremendous consequences. Not being able to sleep has tremendous consequences for the body and for the mind. And so they are in, unable to concentrate. They are unable to pay attention. They look very much ADHD for yeah. many reasons. Uh, one of them is that they have not had enough sleep, but also that they are not able to self-regulate. Yeah. They are so disconnected from their bodies that they cannot self-regulate. Yeah. Well, you know, a good night's sleep is such an integral part of being able to function and stay calm and sort of be present. So um, what I'm taking from you is that part of the reparative work is to really start with the basics. Um, pay attention to your breathing, do what you can to really get a good night's sleep and then um, build from there. Absolutely, and I'm glad that you bring that up because people start trauma therapy and uh, there are many therapists out there that don't fully understand how important mm -hmm. it is to take care of the body first before yeah. you you engage in this roller coaster that you're going to engage into. Yeah, uh, I learned this from Dr. Judy Herman, who I, I worked oh, yes. with. She wrote the book Trauma and Recovery, and uh, yeah. she's very well known. It's been a bestseller. Yeah, uh, and in her, in the training that I did with her uh, as as a supervisee, I uh, learned that yes, uh, taking care of the body is very important before you engage in the exploration yeah. of the trauma. Uh, some therapists go straight to the uh, to the discussion of the trauma without fully understanding how important mm -hmm. it is to make sure that the body is regulated before you do that. Well, that's really interesting. It makes me think about Maslow's hierarchy, mm -hmm. um, kind of like a trauma version of Maslow's hierarchy. Start at the base of the pyramid. Make sure you're breathing. <laughs> make sure you get a good take care of your body and then build from there. So that's very interesting. Thank you for yeah. that. And make sure that you also trust your therapist. That's super important, especially if the nature of the trauma that you went through is on, on an interpersonal ba basis. So it's more of an interpersonal trauma because you could go through a disaster trauma, let's say an earthquake. And uh, uh, traumas that have more long lasting effect are mainly related to interpersonal traumas. And well, that, those are the ones that mostly impact the capacity to feel trust towards others and the world. Well, that makes perfect sense, absolutely, because then you're dealing with the baseline of a relationship. Um, and if that's been disrupted um, by um, having the bonds of trust, um, you know, uh, 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 fall, that they've fallen apart, then it makes perfect sense that building a trusting relationship with somebody that you're working with would be a critical part of building that pyramid. So thank you for, for clarifying that. I appreciate it. Well, you know, I know that one of your particular interests is intergenerational trauma mm -hmm. um, and uh, that the trickle down effect of one generation's trauma into the next um, can often be at the core of, you know, our whole country is experiencing a, a mental health crisis these days. And I know that part of your interest is in trying to understand the role of intergeneration, intergenerational trauma. In, in passing along mental health challenges to younger generations. So could you help us understand better what is intergenerational trauma and how is it that trauma can be passed from one generation to succeeding generations? 
Sure. Up to recent times, we only knew that perhaps events that parents had gone through would have an impact on the offspring of those parents uh, and in a behavioral way, right? Mm -hmm. Because we learn to attach and we learn to cope from our parents, yeah. from our caretakers. Yeah. And so if we have uh, disruptive uh, or uh, broken or disruptive at attachments, or if we have parents that are, are unable to provide uh, or to help the, the child regulate, that will have a significant implication on how the child will deal with stress in their lives, mm -hmm. right? Or parents might might cope with life by using substances, alcohol, mm -hmm. drugs, because uh, sometimes that's the only way they have to cope, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so we we transmit um, not only the ways to um, the capacity to self regulate uh, or that ability, that knowledge on how to self regulate and to trust ourselves. But we also transmit the ways uh, or we inherit the ways that our parents cope with difficulties. Mm -hmm. So that's on the behavioral level. That's how we transmit. Things. Yeah. It's like, oh, you know, we've always done this like this, um, this way in this family. And yeah. that's how we do it in this family. Yeah. You know, uh, this is a stiff upper lip and whatever. Um, and that's a, one good example. But there also recently, I would say maybe in the 80s, uh, um, we um through the research by Dr. Rachel Yehuda, we started, uh, she did some research on offspring of Holocaust survivors, and mm -hmm. she noticed that they were presenting symptoms of PTSD, and yet they had never been in the Holocaust. Yeah. And so uh, then she started all her research uh, by uh, exploring that. And, uh, and so, and then the field of epigenetics uh, yeah. came in and which is basically uh, the uh, epigenetics is alteration in genes expression or mm -hmm. in, in how genes function. And so uh, depending on the environment. So some mm -hmm. genes, will, genes will express themselves, others won't. She also noticed in mo most recent studies that there are changes in the uh, when when a mother goes through a traumatic event when she's pregnant mm -hmm. that would impact the gene expression mm -hmm. or the, the genes uh, of mm -hmm. the not the dna code but the gene expression of their the the baby yeah. also uh the events um um even even um the event uh, the events that the mother went through even before she got pregnant mm -hmm. uh, will impact the egg also the the sperm and uh, eventually um, sort of all the environment around the womb when, when the mother is pregnant. Mm -hmm. So that also is something that uh, she studied um, mothers of um, babies after September 11. Um, oh. And that's uh, how she came up with, with that idea that the uh, traumatic event uh, experienced by the mother when she's pregnant might impact and and in fact she saw that these babies were more uh, sensitive irritable um, had more difficulties coping with stressors uh, etc so it's yeah. such it's such fascinating research and it seems to me to be so important to understand that like you were talking before about how the behavioral aspects modeling within families we can all understand that because uh, we can relate to it from whatever kind of upbringing that we had. But what you're talking about is deeper and more encoded in not DNA transmission so much, as you point out, but it's which genes are going to be expressed or which are, they're there, but they'll either find expression or not be turned on or turned off, in other mm -hmm. words, depending upon, um, you know, a traumatic experience that a previous generation has. It seems like such a profound idea. Um, and perhaps the key to understanding, well, a lot about human behavior, <laughs> I think. Mm -hmm. um, but it also seems to me, um, Dr. Matar, to underscore how important it is for people who have experienced the trauma to understand its impact on them and to find some kind of therapeutic methodology, a therapist that they trust, or some way to learn to breathe, to be present in the moment, to somehow heal themselves and the impact the trauma has had on their, as you put it earlier, their ability to be present, their ability to take care of themselves physically, and then to disrupt the intergenerational transmission. Have I been understanding you about why this is so important? 
That is absolutely correct. I think the most important mechanism to disrupt this intergenerational chain is to talk about the trauma. Yeah. But then, unfortunately, in families, there is something called what some trauma therapists call the, the there's a conspiracy of silence mm-hmm. that people don't want to talk about trauma. Yeah. Uh, and um, it is something that will perpetuate itself if you don't address it, if you don't talk about yeah. it. But we have uh, in, in families we and in society, we have mechanisms to shut down the conversation, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that in itself, people think sometimes that, oh, no, if you, we don't want to talk about that, that was so traumatic. And, uh, and I understand why they do that. They're trying to protect themselves. However... If this is never addressed, never talked about, then this will be well, this will keep uh, transmitting from one generation to, to another through many in many ways, yeah. through uh, veiled uh, language or veiled messages, through uh, ways of doing things, ways of coping, uh, avoidance, b- avoidant behaviors. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's fascinating all the things that can happen yeah. transpire when you don't address the trauma. Yeah. It's a perfect storm, um, an, an intergenerational perfect storm, in other words, um, and that just requires, at a basic level, the kind of understanding that you're bringing to it so that people can understand the trauma that you go through doesn't just affect you. Um, you know, if you don't heal from it, the danger is if you become a parent, everybody has some kind of family, that it ripples outward and has an impact. And it's even in your genes mm-hmm. um, and, and what genes will get turned on or turned off in, uh, you know, in children that you'll have and, and future generations. So it seems like a very profound kind of understanding, really important. I'm so glad it's finally getting the attention that, that you and others are bringing to it. Mm-hmm. There's another idea that I wanted to explore with you. Um, does a traumatic event have to happen to us personally? Now, you know, we've talked about how in families there's that transmission, but sometimes people, it's not that a family member, a previous generation experienced a trauma, but they've witnessed it and somebody they might not be related to, or they learn about it. Um, they read about it. They learn about it in history. They see films or news footage because there's a lot of terror. There's a lot of, sadly, there's a lot of brutality um, at any given time happening across the planet, close to home and far away from home. And in the age of communications that we live in, um, there's a thin or sometimes no barrier between our witnessing uh, of these events. Um, So when that happens, whether it's through current or historic, current news reports or historical narratives of terrible forms of war, slavery, rape, starvation, um, you name it, do can people be traumatized by that act of witnessing you know um it depends on whether you have a history of trauma but uh-huh. certainly uh, there is a criteria in the dsm the diagnostic manual of uh, mental illness that we use the dsm-5 mm-hmm. uh, there is a criteria that the person either went through the traumatic event or that they heard uh about the traumatic event the details about the traumatic event for, for, of of someone that they love or someone yeah. near to them. Okay. Yes, for sure. Um, so if we watch things on TV, uh, it can be traumatizing or not, depending on who you are. Because okay. yes, it, that your own history of trauma, your own family's history of trauma, that will impact the way that you respond to the traumatic event or the traumatic imagery. Uh, for example, vets that have histories of uh, previous history of post-traumatic stress disorder or histories of trauma, they will respond to uh, the trauma, the war trauma in uh, more significant ways than others that don't have. So they have more uh, more of a likelihood of developing PTSD because they have previous histories of trauma. That's the, already very clear in the research. Yes. Yeah. So it depends. Also, it depends on your cultural community. I know I'm thinking of, of brutal killings um, out, uh, out there in the community uh, by police of African-Americans, for example. Yeah. Uh, for a mother who has, imagine a mother has two boys, adult boys, they they go out at night. Um, that image of that we've seen, all seen on TV of of many African American men being um, mistreated and and brutally yeah. killed. Uh, that is something that will definitely impact because that's one of them, and and yeah. so that will definitely impact uh, and create um, 
uh, a lot of fear, a lot of fear bordering on uh, traumatic reactions. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, which everything you're saying makes perfect sense. And if I'm understanding you, a lot of the impact that that, I guess it's some kind of called secondary trauma, um, yeah. would be would depend upon the person's own individual history uh, of either a traumatic experience or someone in your family. And even um, gender, even gender. So yeah. gender, race, uh, women have higher rates of PTSD than men. Oh, okay. Men would, would have on average four to 5%. Uh, so four out of a hundred, whereas women is eight out of a hundred. And, and, and what is viewed as the reason for that? Well, uh, um, I think there's no uh, a clear explanation, but women experience a high rate of sexual abuse and yes. rape. Yeah. Uh, not to say that men don't experience it, but yeah. women do experience a higher rate and they are more, yeah. uh, yes. Yeah. And and women live with the fear of that um, constantly. Um, it, it, it hasn't gone away. <laughs> so Absolutely. that's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, well, Dr. Matar, I know that one of your areas of practice and research is trauma-informed therapy. Mm -hmm. um, you've talked about the importance of trusting your therapist, and you mm -hmm. talked earlier about how it's important um, to know where to begin, begin with the body, begin with breathing, begin with sleep. But could you say a bit more about what it means, uh, trauma-informed therapy, and how it works and how it helps? So uh, going back to Judy Herman's book, Trauma and Recovery, the way I was trained was that uh, the technique is something, while well, well, the technique or the, the method that you use to treat trauma is certainly important because there are some techniques that are more evidence-based than others. I think what's most important is through understand the stages that, of treatment. For example, the first stage is just developing trust and regulating the body of the person, regulating their health. And that can take a full year. You know, sometimes it can take a full year creating that trusting environment that is conducive to the exploration of the trauma. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't create a trusting, trusting environment, then there are lots of complications when you start talking about the actual trauma. Uh. Yeah. Also, the, the, there's a misunderstanding of how trauma impacts the body. And there's a division in the field of trauma around that. Some therapists don't are not interested in, in working with the body. Mm -hmm. uh, and others uh, claim that for sure you have to work with the body because uh, the trauma is inscribed in the body as yeah. well, which is something that I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and now that I know more about uh, yogic philosophies, about um, how the body works and also some Tibetan medicine knowledge that I have, I understand that for sure trauma does leave an impact in the body. And so when I talk about working with the body, I mean regulating the body, making sure that the person is eating well, making sure that the person is not hypervigilant, that we can bring them back to uh, to baseline, making sure that they're sleeping, making sure that they are engaging in self-care, um, they, that they know how to do that because that's a very difficult for someone uh, yeah. that has experienced trauma so that's the first stage and then this the second stage is more of then discussing the memories of the trauma and also even daring to discuss what are some of the implications of what people did under let's say they use substances mm -hmm. or also dealing with guilt and uh morality issues when there are issues of of, of sexual abuse and yeah. incest and things like that legal issues uh then um the last stage would be to how do you reintegrate in society Mm -hmm. in ways that are dignified and how do you switch from an identity of the victim to an identity of a survivor mm -hmm. because i think that we talk so much about trauma in society that everybody feels like a victim right mm -hmm. yeah. uh, like oh trauma happened to me poor me uh, and and which is yeah it's it's poor yeah. you yeah i understand but at the same time you have to move that identity or that self-identification to another space where you see yourself uh, more of a survivor that can move on and not be trapped in in the past and yeah. in the trauma. Yeah, this is this is controversial, I think. Um, but I've seen that uh, among my patients, that those that are able to move from victim to survivor are do much better in terms of uh, recovery. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really interesting as you describe the process moving from 
you know, self-care, um, taking care of your body, being able to stay in the moment, um, being able to regulate, um, you know, to become aware of what your body feels like when you're hypervigilant, just to recognize, to have that word, that vocabulary, and to know what it means, and then be able to feel like there are things you can do to calm down. Well, it makes me think about what you were saying near the beginning when you talked about one of the people you work with said it was such a relief, yes. um, you know, just to be able to be in the moment. And it was kind of a novel experience for them or one they hadn't had for a long time. And so, you know, to me, it sounds like you are kind of, in a way, moving up that pyramid um, then to helping people regain a sense of their own. Well, you know, it almost sounds I'd put it in charge of their own identity. Um, yes. and, and, you know, nobody, I mean, people are victimized. I mean, there's no way around that, but no one wants to feel like a victim or have that as your identity. We mm -hmm. want to feel like we can heal, um, there. And that's what, that's what you're describing. That that's you what I'm describing. Yes. That's exactly what you're describing that mm -hmm. you help people feel like they are in charge of their healing process and it works. Um, yes. and it's transformative. And that sounds just incredibly powerful. Um, you know, and more so uh, the the knowledge, understanding what's happening in their bodies and yeah. minds, and that's the 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 part of psychoeducation that you have to do yeah. during the trust period. Yeah. You do a lot of psychoeducation, and I spend a lot of time. And people go like, "Oh, no wonder why I do this. Oh, is that why I do that?" And for them, it's such a relief because yeah. that means that they are not going crazy. Well, right? yes, and there's such freedom in that. You know, understanding and awareness create freedom, and then you can maneuver in your life, and perhaps, um, you know, the options may become available for you then that you never might have perhaps have dreamed of because you haven't had the the, the freedom of mind um, and body and uniting mind and body to be able to pursue creative options for how you want to live in the world. So it sounds like very powerful and very important um, work that you do, Dr. Matar. I'm glad you're doing it. Um, and, you know, we've talked some about these profound ideas and, and how important it is uh, for us to understand. But I just would like you to comment upon why is it important that all of us, everybody, that we all understand more about exactly what we've been talking about, about intergenerational trauma? You know, I uh, I feel so strong about uh, educating around yeah. um, edu educating the community and families around trauma, yeah. because uh, I've seen in my career in psychology that many of the diagnoses that have come through my uh, office pr are probably related to trauma, and yet mm -hmm. we don't name it. Yeah. Uh, I do think yeah. when we we uh, founded the Division of Trauma Psychology at the American Psychological Association, and uh, we try we had to convince the American Psychological Association that we needed a division, oh. uh, and the argument I mean we uh, it was not. Um, uh, it was easy. It was easy to convince them because the truth is that now research and we have now the technology, the CAT scans and MRIs to show how trauma and also the measurements in the in the blood and, and the saliva and all that, that can show how trauma can impact yeah. uh, the body and, and, the, and, and the behavior of people. So I'm very excited that... Um, that this is more out there in the public. Again, um, many of the diagnoses have to do with trauma histories. I even see that even psychotic events uh, mm -hmm. or psychotic diagnoses uh, might be related to traumatic events in childhood or chronic trauma. So yes, this is extremely important. We need to talk more about it and we need to disrupt the chain of yeah. intergenerational trauma by talking about it. And yeah. we need to help people validate themselves and their, and their experiences. There's nothing more liberating than understanding that yes, this is happened. This happened to me. This yeah. is not a figment of my imagination. This is wrong. Yeah, and uh, and I can I can heal from this. And I can heal from this, yeah. which is which is um, so important. Um, well, Dr. Matar, um, your your educational work is so important, and you've educated me. So thank you very much for that. I really appreciate it. I'm just so appreciative that you're doing the work that you do. And I'm so grateful to you for taking the time to visit the morning show today to teach us about mm -hmm. these really profound and transformative ideas and the work that you do um, to help people heal. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.
That's it for today, everybody. Please join us again next Thursday at nine for the morning show. Until then, be well. Bye now.